A very warm welcome to everyone. Today is the first session of Twinkling Conversations with Jugni. And uh, these sessions will be conducted by Deepika Chan. Deepika Chan, welcome. I would like to compliment you on behalf of the advisory board and uh, uh, my, my editorial team. So, and I wish you all the best. This is a very nice initiative and I hope uh, that you would get more and more people uh, involved in it. We get to know about more and more writers, sportspersons, uh, creative people from all the creative fields, hopefully. So I'm being told that the first uh, guest for today's program is Dr. Koshi. So we are also very honored to have him with us and uh, we feel very privileged. So Deepika ji, I wish you all the best. This is a very nice initiative. Rivers would support this. Thank you. And uh, once again, I would like to compliment you on behalf of my advisory board and editorial board. Thank you. Have a lovely session ahead. All the best. Thank you so much. So this is streaming live from Twinkling Conversations with Jimmy. And today we have with us the illustrious, the maverick, the iconoclastic, the pioneer, Dr. Ampar Koshi. And I would like to tell you a little bit about him. He is so many things I really don't know where to start from, but I will tell you that he's an assistant professor at the Department of English at Jazan University, Saudi Arabia. He has written, co-written, and co-edited 24 books till now. And he wishes to, I, I, a little bird told me that he wishes to reach 100. And he's a Pushkar Poetry Prize nominee 2012, Hindu Fiction Prize nominee 2017. He's a reputed critic and expert on Samuel Beckett, besides being a literary theorist, theoretical. He's instituted the Real International Literary Prize in 2014, named after his son, Drew. And he's founded TSL called, the, the full version is the Significant League, and made the Rosette Sonnet form, and runs an autism NPO with his wife, Anna Gabriel. So over to you, Dr. Koshi. I would I heartily welcome you today. <laughs> I heartily thank welcome you, you today. Much. Yes. Yeah, thanks to Rivers and Afan and you also for this opportunity. And I hope that this is going to be a very good session on literature and art. And Absolutely. Absolutely. And well, it's, it's definitely going to be because you're a brilliant man. And my first question to you is, what does poetry mean to you, doctor? Which one can reading or writing save your soul when you're drowning, assuming that it does? Um, poetry uh, means many things to many people. And uh, it's difficult to define it uh, even for me because every time I try to give a definition, it changes. Right. So uh, I would like to uh, tell you that uh, right now, it means uh, to me uh, something very precious that, uh, you know, helps me to kind of stay afloat or not go adrift because mm -hmm. the more I write it, you know, it's almost like I'm writing for my own survival. So at present, poetry is a way of uh, survival for me. That's my definition as of now. That's, a, that's fantastic. Absolutely. And uh, I would like our viewers to know that Dr. Koshi has been in Saudi Arabia uh, for uh, about what, 10 years? Is it 10 years now? Yes, and 10 years, and his family is in Bangalore. So poetry has certainly uh, been uh, an amazing tool of survival for him, as it is for, I think, most poets, uh, whether they admit it or not. Dr. Koshi, who is your muse and or muses? Do you have multiple muses down the years? Have you ever written raw, guttural, confessional poetry like Sylvia Plath? Yeah, I'm also reading the comments. So uh, mm. thanks to Roma and Santosh who says I'm levitating. So 
she she was the energy to flow thank you bilal yeah but i want to talk about this matter of muses you know uh i think that the word muse in the present world just means inspiration and uh when you're really tapped into the spirit of poetry everything inspires you everyone inspires you so everything and everyone is a muse and uh, Uh, no 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 that is a very that is a very diplomatic conventional answer i want real raw answers from you today <laughs> no you are, you ask me whether i write confessional raw guttural poetry yes. like sylvia plath and i think uh, everybody knows uh, i do that you know i write very confessional very raw uh, poetry which is guttural yeah poetry is not supposed to be that but still uh and you know it's a uh, uh, it can often be like a scream it can be like a laugh it can be like a kafa or it can be like a haina uh, haina's <laughs> laugh anything uh, and you know when you come back to this thing about muses yes of course uh, you know in uh, you know because we did that book together uh, the, the two hours yes and my poem is all about my muses and you know in fact i've always been writing about my muses the greeks had nine muses and they were feminine all of them were feminine so yeah even my muse you know, right from the beginning my first muse was my mother who made me write and you know you i'll i'll answer your question like this physically you know um uh speaking i mean you're attracted to uh the feminine muse but you find a little bit of that muse in every woman you come across you know it may be If you're talking physically, it may be one person's eyes, it may be another person's nose, it may be another person's lips, another person's chin, and so on and so forth. I mean, that's oh my thinking. God! I have to tell you something here. This, yeah. you know, I'm getting goosebumps right now because uh, there's this. Uh, you, I'm sure you've heard of him, Shiv Kumar Batalvi. He was asked the same question: who his muse was, and that interview took place in London. and he said the exact same thing that you said and it's giving me goosebumps because this is what a, you know a writer is all about because writers inspired by the the very air you know the writer can be inspired by a pen everything is zen for him so the fact that you said that you know somebody's eyes somebody's fingers somebody's you know hair you know i i, I completely relate to that and uh, that's amazing Can yeah, I but I want to ask. Just, sorry. Just one second. Just one thing more. But I don't mm -hmm. want to end with physical. I mean, it's also psychological, right? You may be impressed by one person's intelligence, another person's emotional quotient, another person's you know kindness, another, a fourth person's compassion, a fifth person's uh, you know loving nature. So you know, it comes from all over the place, from everywhere, from everyone. Yes, absolutely. But I want to ask you something. because there are many times that uh, you know a poet or an author he's he's got a writer's block and and um, he doesn't have a muse at that moment so can a poet write great poetry without a muse uh, in your opinion know, to be honest i uh, i haven't had a writer's block i can't remember ever having had a writer's block but i guess that it 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 may come in the future as you grow older maybe for me i don't know uh because you know i uh, write more like it's automatic writing right i i just let it flow through me and uh, as i told you you know i i i haven't lacked muses also whether it's women or books or films or art sculpture drama science i mean life people around you ordinary situations so uh, yeah i i i i am sorry <laughs> you're probably asking this question to the wrong person no no not at all <laughs> not at all my question is basically about you know can you write great poetry without a muse so yeah you you're the last person i should have asked that now in your opinion does the world view the poet as the quintessential dreamer you know consider dreamer here as a loser one who forever pines and laments for his unrequited love does the world view a poet like that i i think that many people in the world view a poet as a loser 
as a dreamer. <laughs> yes. And as a starving as artist. Yeah, as a starving artist, and you know, someone who's you know always uh, pining for some uh, lost love in the past. Lost, lost I, love. I, a poet is always in love. This I, I will guarantee you that. Uh, the yeah, muses may change. The muses may change. The poet is always in love. Okay. Yes. Tell yeah. me. You should know about it being a poet. I mean, in fact, any mm -hmm. poets are watching me and Sunita and all that. So. I think all of you should know about it. I don't think that a poet is a loser or a dreamer or always pining after some lost love. But a lot of people look at poets and think they are like that. And poets may be starving artists. That's a different matter. Yes, may or may exactly. Be. Yeah. Okay, are we as readers attracted to doomed tragedies because it makes the flawed human being in us feel safe in the knowledge? that the other person is in misery as well? It's a very dark question. You know, I'm not, I'm not attracted as a reader to doomed tragedies. I, I <laughs> like a, a holistic, the books I like most, you know. For <laughs> example, I like epic poems and uh, scriptures, which I consider as poetry, not so much as scripture. And I like them because, you know, they give you a full spectrum of life where, you know, there's tragedy, uh, there's comedy, there's tragic comedy, there are characters who are good, bad, ugly, all kinds of things. You know, I like Shakespeare because of that. Because, you know, he uh, doesn't uh, try to draw, I mean, people speak of the five tragedies of Shakespeare, but he also wrote many comedies, he wrote histories, he wrote dramatic romances, he, I mean, it was a very full spectrum. So, I am also that kind of reader. I remember having a conversation with you once uh, last year, which uh, was very fascinating to me because we were talking about ex existentialism and we went on a tangent and we talk, spoke about nihilism and everything connected to it. And you, I mean, you really uh, uh, know a lot about it. I, I want to know what your thoughts are about it, about existentialism. And have you included that in your poetry? Of course. Uh, my poetry deals very much with ex existentialism uh, because, uh, you know, uh, I feel that, you know, I also have a background in philosophy. I, I studied uh, philosophy uh, a lot and especially Western philosophy. And, you know, one of the questions, you know, if you're a philosopher, the questions you ask, uh, you know, who am I? You know, where do I come from? Where am I going? You know, uh, can I know that I know anything for sure? These questions, and they are actually questions connected to existentialism. You know? They're existential questions, especially the question, who am I? I mean, do I exist at all? If I exist, you know, am I becoming something or am I already something? You know, and you know, or what is being? So these questions are indispensable and very much a part of poetry. And nihil nihilism, as I told you, since I deal with the entire spectrum, yeah, I definitely don't keep out anarchy, I don't keep out nihilism, I don't keep out uh, destruction or deconstruction in the same way that I don't keep out construction or creativity or other things. They come in very much. There were some other isms that you added. I forget which they were, <laughs> which ones you mentioned. <laughs> But anyway, here I, I take a, a, a second to thank uh, the guests who, and you know the viewers who've uh, tuned in. And I would uh, request you to subscribe to our channel, uh, YouTube channel at Rivers. And uh, thank you again. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you a question, uh, which is a little tricky. In the Blue Hours, that the book that we co-authored, uh, you co-authored with me, or I could work it with you, you gave me the opportunity, uh, you know, to get me off my lazy person <laughs> and print my book. You've written this poem, this really long poem called Swapna Sundari, where your muse takes on different forms in different cities and you kind of, you come across, you bump across uh, this muse or you, you're somewhere you're chasing the muse and the muse is Fascinating. It's it's like a old uh, JCT ad that I had, you know I had seen long ago, uh, where the guy is chasing. He's in a train and the girl vanishes, 
Uh, it's very, very mysterious and sorry. So you come across your muse who keeps changing forms in different countries. Now, in one of the, one of the uh, paragraphs, you mentioned your muse as being a man. So what is your sexual orientation, Dr. Amput Koshi? And your thoughts on LGBTQIA? This is a very uh, cheeky question, but uh, <laughs> I, I, never, I never spoke of the muse as a man, okay? I spoke of the muse as in a particular place, reminding me of someone who is like a man. Okay. And you know, that's, uh, you know, if you look at women, you know, they don't look like women all the time. Sometimes they do right. look like uh, men. And you know, there's a concept of the Ardha Nairishwari. You know, that all of us are, you know, half men and half women. Yes, yes. And uh, whether you uh, think of it, uh, you know, mentally or sexually or whatever, uh, you, you can be, uh, you know, attracted to a woman who looks like a man. And I, I speak of that, you know, in uh, uh, probably a slightly uh, earthy, earthy or carnal way. Uh, but uh, it has a deeper layer. <laughs> and about my, about my sexual orientation, uh, you know, I of course believe that it's an entirely private thing what a sex, person's sexual orientation is. But I am straight and I am also, you know, totally at ease with people who belong to, you know, lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transsexual, intersexual, asexual, or queer tendencies. Right. I'm well, I, I, I'm, a to, I'm a total hypocrite. I want I, the whole world can be anything they want except my children. Okay, I find Firdaus, Firdaus has written, <laughs> Firdaus is writing that she's all ears for this answer which you gave just now. She's like, she says, I'm all ears. Yeah. Okay, the next, <laughs> next question. Which character would you fancy yourself in if you were in a Shakespearean book and why? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, before that, I just want to comment on, you know, Febi says he likes Swapna Sundri and uh, Lily says this is very carnal, what I said. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'll bring it to the question, you know, let's, right. look, at Shakespeare. let's look at Shakespeare, you know. Shakespeare writes uh, things that are really carnal. There are many really carnal things in his writing, okay. Uh, uh, especially, um, he talks about the between Venus and Adonis. Venus as an older woman uh, and not just as a goddess of love, chasing Adonis is a younger boy who runs away all the time. You know, and she's trying to seduce him and make love to him. So that carnal right. thing is there. Uh, now you you ask me which character in Shakespeare uh, really attracts me. And strangely enough, they are women characters, you know. For example, I'm very much attracted to Cordelia in King Lear. Cordelia for me is an unforgettable character. You know, how right. she is a good daughter to King Lear and later <laughs> she's misunderstood and driven away by him. But finally when he's dying, you know, only she is there to look after him. And he understands too late that she was the person he should have uh, trusted and loved and uh, not, uh, you know, the other two daughters. So Cordelia would be, I think, as that name comes first to my mind, definitely my most famous, uh, I mean, most favorite Shakespearean character, uh, one whom I would like to be. Oh, Thank wow. You. Okay. I, I somehow thought it would be some man, but that, that's very interesting. That's right. Yeah. What's the second one? I want to know what's the second one. <laughs> Who's the second one? As I said, that's, uh, you know, uh, the, the second one is, you know, also a very interesting character and in Midsummer Night's Dream it's a character okay. called uh, Puck you know? okay. and mm -hmm. Puck is uh, yes. as you know a kind of a fairy absolutely also like yes. a, a mischievous elf and you know he has this fantastic line you know, what fools these mortals be mm -hmm. looking at the love affairs of you know uh, men and women he walks with the fairies. I mean, for me, he's a fascinating character, you know, because you can't uh, pin him down. The others in the play or in the real world can't pin a character down, like Puck, down into being what they want him to be. 
So he's the character whom I love. Awesome. Here I have to tell the viewers something. That you know, uh, the professor, his the typical uh, archetype of a professor is you know, it, it's very misleading as far as Dr. Koshi is concerned. Why? Because he he looks sedate and very unassuming, but he's not. Once in a while, he just throws everything, the caution to the winds, and he leaves everybody agape. <laughs> he will write the most outlandish things on his Facebook page or TSL. And uh, he's, he's very unconventional. I, I want the viewers to know. He's a very interesting character. And if we were in the Victorian era, I am sure that the ladies from then would, you know, they would faint and they would say, where are my smelling salts? <laughs> With the kind of things he writes, even in some of his poetry. I remember that we were sitting in Sadhbirji's house and uh, you were, of course, uh, we, we were all a group of poets and you were all reading our poems. And you asked uh, uh, Sadhbirji or Sunita to read one of the poems and it was extremely erotic. And uh, Sunita said, I'm not going to read it. <laughs> I remember that, you know. Anyway, do you think in today's day and age, aggressive self-publicity about one's work works is a mandatory marketing tool for poets, or somewhere it defeats its very purpose. See, you know, this depends uh, because there are, you know, two kinds of uh, writers today. One, right. those who are lucky enough to get a contract with, you know, a big publisher like Penguin or someone like that, in which case they do the marketing. But still, the writer has to do a lot of marketing for himself. Hmm. And then there are uh, people like uh, people who don't uh, publish with such big publishers. Hmm. Maybe they haven't tried or they didn't get access to whatever. Uh, in their case, they have to market themselves. There's no other choice. You know, because no one else is going to do it for them. Right. And in a way, in a way, it defeats the purpose because you know people know about you, people hear about you, people like you, you're famous, uh, all that. But often you end up marketing yourself, and they don't actually read what you have written, but they only read you know what you write about how the things uh, you write which are about marketing yourself. So in a way, it's self-defeating. They really don't read you. I'm always surprised when someone says to me, uh, "I have read you." And I'm not at all surprised when people say to me, I've heard of you. <laughs> That's uh, you know, what happens when you market to yourself. Right. Uh, to come, back, to come back to that question of, you know, the, uh, you know, it's not like a split personality. I have multiple personalities. When I'm a okay. teacher, I'm a teacher. When I'm a writer, I'm a writer. When I'm mm -hmm. fooling around, I'm fooling around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, when I'm a critic, I'm a critic. When I'm a poet, I'm a poet. So You're you also just, a musician. We yeah. know that you're a musician. You sing and you, on the guitar and you strum your guitar. Right. So I integrate them inside me, but others may see it as weird that one day he writes as if he's mad, another day he writes like a poet, another day he writes like a critic. Mm -hmm. But for me, there's no split between all these personalities. Of course, there are different facets of your personality. Facets, yeah. I mean, it's the same so, for you, it's the same for everyone. Of course, I, I'm an artist. Uh, when I'm an, art, an artist, I'm, I'm painting. And when yeah. I'm a poet, I, basically, I, I'm, I'm a crazy poet. I'm, I'm quintessentially, uh, and I'm very lazy. Uh, <laughs> if you, yeah, if you and Santoshi hadn't pushed me, I wouldn't even have published my book. But now, I feel that before I die, I must publish a few books. I, I feel right. that it's it's important for my soul, which I I plan to do now. So thank you, thank you so much. Yes. What fascinates you about Samuel Beckett's works? Has waiting for Godot influenced your manner of writing? Yeah, Samuel Beckett's works uh, uh, fascinate me because he's, he's one of the best writers I have come across. Completely you agree. Look, you look at, I mean, I'm not just talking about waiting for Godot, which everyone knows about. Of course. And they like, and they like it, or they don't like it, they hate it. I don't know about it. I, because, you know, the real truth is uh, that's only a very slim part of the tip of the iceberg of Beckett but but he's such a fantastic writer in terms of his uh, mastery of the language of how good he is at uh, experimenting with language and how well he writes it's so powerful if you really go into his work and 
um, uh, if you talk about waiting for Godo, of course it has influenced me, it has influenced everyone. Uh, but much more than waiting for Godo, you know, he, uh, Beckett is on an ontological journey. Uh, and that has influenced me tremendously. He, you can say that, uh, you know, I, I really know what I'm doing as a writer, especially regarding the future. It has all fallen into place for me because, you know, I learned from Beckett how to write and what to write about and when and where and why, you know, I, he was on a search and he found it and I was mm -hmm. on the same search and I found it and the one person who has helped me really find what I have to write about now in the coming year is Beckett. Uh, can you give us some tips on what you mean by that? Like, what are, what is it that you found out, how, how to write? No, you see, there are so many writers in India, for example, yes. and they're all writing. And many of them are very good writers. But if you really look at them, you know, uh, I don't think that they have, you know, uh, I don't think that they have like an idea, you know, this is why I'm a writer. This is what I have to write about. I really know. Hmm. But if you look at the great uh, European writers like Rilke, or, you know, of course, earlier in India, we had it, you know, Valmiki or Vyasa, they knew why they were writing. They knew who they were writing for, what they were going to write, and you know what the purpose was. Mm -hmm. You know, they, 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 their life's work was very clear to them. And you know, but if you look at uh, the uh, writers in India now, they are very good. But I don't think they really have like uh, thought about it the way a Joyce has, a Beckett has, a, a Rilke has, or you know, other, other Rambo, other Rambo, for example, the French uh, poet whom I really admire. Hmm. You know, he, he had a homosexual relation with Paul Verlaine. Mm -hmm. Verlaine, in the film Fatal Eclipse, he says, I came to you to learn from you how to write because I knew what to write. And now that I've learned from you how to write, now I'll go back and uh, write what I want to write. And, you know, he wrote a few uh, poems and books and he stopped because he was so clear, unlike others. This is so what I, yes, I'm doing. And this clarity, I don't have proof for it. I have 24 books and they're good in patches and flashes, flashes and streaks of greatness. But this clarity I have, which I doubt that others in India have really. This is, I, I really know what I am about. And it took me a long time, okay, it took me many years. So you're one of the lucky ones if you know, you found yourself and you know what you yeah, want yeah. to write. Absolutely. Right, I'm lucky. Yeah. I'm lucky. So, you're, yeah. What are the five things people don't know about you? <laughs> uh, I, I think that you know, uh, people people don't know that uh, I I didn't want to be a writer. What I wanted to be was a rock star. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I want the viewers to know that I call him Doc Star because he's a, <laughs> he's, a, he's got a doctorate for uh, his research work and critique on uh, Samuel Bukit. Beckett, and uh, he's also uh, a rock star because he strums and he sings. So I call him Dark Star. Yeah, and so, some people yes. call me Dark Star. <laughs> 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 yeah, so uh, that's one thing. I wanted to be a rock star. So the second thing is, you know, uh, I spend all my time listening to uh, rock music of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s as a result. And you know the second, yeah. So the, these are two things. I listen only to rock music mainly, and I wanted to be a rock star. Uh, the third thing is that, you know, I'm crazy about films where, like I said, the director knows what he is what he doing. Right. Because right. I learned a lot from directors like uh, Tarkovsky, and uh, you know, there, there are there are some directors. You know, they they are. Right. Incredible, worth watching because they. So, know which are which are the which are the movies that you like? A couple of movies, if you can mention. You know, yesterday I watched a fantastic film called Time, and Time. It, it's, it's, it's a 2000. It was uh, released on uh, January 25th of uh, 2020 in Sundance, and you know it's it's a documentary film about a black woman with her husband this they, they you know they try to uh, rob a bank and mm -hmm. she has to go to jail for three and a half years but her husband is given 60 years in jail 
and she has six children and it's a documentary wow. mm -hmm. and it, it's about how she brings them up how she refuses to go down how she fights and how she says that although we should have been sent to jail 60 years is too long and how she tries to keep hope alive and you know, it's, it becomes a love story the story mm -hmm. of waiting hope and longing a terrific mm -hmm. black and white film in uh, 2020 so yeah. i mean just that kind of really high art yeah we are also living in extraordinary times i mean there's a global pandemic going on i am sure that it's made us i, I it's definitely in fact it was this pandemic because there was we weren't allowed to go out. So I sat and did the, uh, book. you know, the, the book and also the the competition <laughs> for which I won that prize, the Sim Poetry yeah, International Poetry Prize. Yes, it was it was fascinating getting up every morning uh, and uh, looking at the new, uh, you know, uh, whatever we're supposed to write about for the day and the new prompt. And uh, it, it, in fact, it was very sad at the time it, it, because be, all of us became so addicted to the prompts. You know, when it ended, it was oh, so I look forward to it this year as well. How did it feel when you instituted the International Real Poetry Prize? And when, and when you wrote your own sonnet? How did it feel when you wrote your own sonnet, the Rosette sonnet? Yes. You must have felt on top of the world. I, I like to surprise myself. I like to do something unexpected, which I never thought of before. So in that spirit, which is there always with me of the pioneer, you know, being a leader of the pack. And, you know, see, uh, I, in that uh, spirit, I instituted an international award. And, you know, in that spirit, I have done a course with Harvard. I have done uh, Napo Remo. I have done Nano Remo twice, written two novels. Hmm. And, you know, uh, making the Rosette sonnet form also was done in the spirit of... Okay, yeah, I, I forgot the word Naporimo. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, and even now, you know, I'm doing one poem a day for kosher kalams, uh, you know, and I've already done 23 poems. Yes, because we've I'm, been reading that. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, the, sonnet, uh, sonnet, the sonnet is a form I love and I know a hell of a lot about it. I've written a book about it. It should be published soon. So uh, it seemed natural to try out a sonnet uh, form. Others have done it. But I, I think I succeeded where others failed because uh, maybe by uh, diluting it or watering it down a bit to Indian uh, levels, a lot of people try my form, which I don't see it happening with forms uh, made by... Yes, yes that is true. Yes. We, we all contributed, uh, I mean, Santoshi, of yeah. course, contributed 50 of them, and we all did one each. Yeah, and I know many, book. No, many people have written more than 50, 50, 100, and all that. Of course, it's on. Okay. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. That's news to me. Wonderful. Please tell us about the role of autism in your life. So autism is something that is like I like to surprise myself. So life through a surprise at me by allowing my son to have autism. And um, it has made my life uh, incredibly richer. Mine, my wife's, my children. I've instituted this uh, prize in uh, his name. Yes. Uh, because, uh, you know, he's non-verbal. And so I think that, you know, I appreciate the gift writers have to express them much more after that. And that's part of it. And I, and I have a non-profit organization. But right now we're not doing much because I am in one place and my wife is in another place. But we have done quite a few things for uh, autism. So when do you hope to visit India? I know you haven't visited for over a year now. Yeah, that's because of COVID. Usually I go home thrice or four times in a year, but now because of COVID, I haven't been there for one year and I'll be coming in June. Okay, Hopefully. fantastic. Well, we hope to see you soon. We, I mean, I haven't even met you uh, in right. person. Uh, here, I'd like to again, take the opportunity to tell the viewers to please send hearts and a lot of likes on our FB page at Rivers. 
and also to subscribe to our channel uh, and uh, to share this video so that we can uh, invite more artists, uh, dancers, photographers, poets, authors. Uh, I feel that the, the creative clan is as such, uh, is the, the, the creme de la creme of society. And uh, I, you know, I'm sure the engineers and the doctors will disagree, but I feel that uh, they, are the, they are the people who uh, bring out their input is what we actually live for and which keeps us alive and going in life because life is extremely brutal. I'm going to ask you uh, another tongue-in-cheek. Uh, no, you, you were saying something. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just want to thank Roma and Lily and uh, Gauri and Fabi and yes. Sunita and all for being there yes. now itself. And yes. I know many others. I, I want to tell everyone at TSL, I love you guys. We all love each other. I mean, we say it to each other all the time. <laughs> so, and Sadhvijaya especially love you. And and Mary Santosh, I love you. Do you think writers are sexier than other people? And why? I don't know how you define sexy. Can you define sexiness first? I think I think it's more than the body, it's the mind which is sexy. And if if your body is sexy and if your mind is sexy, then then you're a Greek god or a goddess, you know. Okay. Yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, naturally I am drawn more to writers than others. Or, uh, no, Lily, I didn't. I mentioned your name several times, Lily. <laughs> <sir. laughs> I just read that, yes. Sunita, I love you too. Yeah. And Lily. <laughs> and Gauri. <Yeah. laughs> and Feb. Yes. Yeah, I am, you know, of course, uh, I, I am drawn to writers, but I don't know whether it is uh, uh, because I consider them sexy or not. No, no, that, that's very boring. I do not expect something so mundane from you. I mean, you have to give us a proper answer. You know? okay. I'm interviewing you seriously on a very cheeky question. So you have to tell us, why do you think? Do you think because people get attracted to people who are cerebral because their mind is so fascinating? Is that it? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, there is a, <laughs> there is a, a word, you know, sapiosexual. So I think that it's more that people find uh, me or you or people like us sexy than that we find others sexy. Yeah, the word is sapiosexual because it's all with uh, to do with the mind, I guess. Yeah. So is there anything else you would like to tell us, uh, Dr. Koshi? I just anything want to else say, you'd like to add? Yeah, I just want to say one thing, you know, that is uh, if you want to be a writer, you know, like I've written so much, I write all the time, but I'm never satisfied because I aim for something really high. Uh, you had asked one of the questions, do you want to be considered a great because you have 24 books and all that? Yes. yes. I don't I don't want to be considered great, but I remember, uh, but I think that you have to keep trying for a certain magic in your works <laughs> of writing. Because then it takes off and people read you even when they don't like you. I, I, I aim for that and I often get it. That's awesome. That's And you often get it, you said. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Your level of confidence. Salute. And um, who are your favorite writers? The contemporary ones. Huh? The contemporary writers? Who do you like amongst the contemporary writers? Uh, you know, I like Oran Pamuk. He's the kind of writer I consider. Uh, you know, I did a whole course in Harvard on, uh, uh, you know, the great writers of today. You know, history of writing and all that. And they, they end with Oran Pamuk. And I'm not talking about him because of them. I'm talking about him because I happened to read a novel by him called Snow. Okay. And, uh, it was fantastic. I like, uh, I of course, I like Salman. Uh, he's another really great writer. There's no doubt right. about it. I wish I had his kind of ability and vocabulary. Uh, he was in hiding. He, he was under underground for how many years? Salman Rushdie? He, he, maybe for three, four years, he had to, three or four years, okay. he had to be underground. Okay, I thought uh, it was and, long. Uh, no, this is, this is uh, you know, one spec, one end of the spectrum. But on the other end of the spectrum, I, you know, I really like writers 
uh, who write, uh, for example, like Royal Dial, you know, simple and easy to mm-hmm. understand, but also really great writers. Royal Dial. So I'm, you okay. know, my daughter reading of some short stories, and I'm reading of some short stories now. Uh, this is a great writer, William Gibson. I got hundreds okay. of books here. I'm not going to show you, but he's he's difficult science fiction. But at the same time, you know, if you take a writer like the writer we gave Nissan Fiction Prize to, right. who wrote children's book, that's the other extreme. I love that kind of thing also, like The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, or you know, uh, Richard Buck's uh, Jonah the Livingston Seagull. I love Alchemist. So out of all his books, I prefer The Alchemist the most. There's something yeah. fascinating about it. And Little Prince, you know, books like that, which live mm-hmm. forever, or Wind in the Willows. It's simple, but it has a magic. It has a zing thing. Zing thing, yeah. People keep reading. That's okay. it. I'm going to ask you, how do you view me as a writer? Please, please be truthful. <laughs> You know, I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted actually, uh, maybe we can do it some other time. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted also for us both to have a, I didn't say a suggested because I don't have the book. But I no. wanted also for both of us to have a books and for you to read out one of your poems for people to see that you are an uh, excellent poet, that you are a very powerful poet. Thank you so much. I, Thank I, you I would so all, much. I would that also makes read. my day and my week. <laughs> Thank you. And I and also read one of my poems. Now, what's missing is that we haven't read our poems. Not so only that, we haven't had a proper launch. We have, we didn't have a physical launch in India. Yeah, you know, right. yes, yes. Yeah. So we come back to that problem that you know we end up talking about what we write rather than you know that people are introduced to what we actually write, which is the best of us. But times are changing, so let this at least be there for now. Well, I just want to tell you that uh, recently I've become hooked on to Mark Strand's poetry. I'm yeah. totally, he is amazing. There's he's this amazing. Poem of, he's, he's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yes. I was so, talking more of novels because I'm into yeah. novel writing right now. So that's why I didn't talk so much about poetry. But he, he is amazing. I agree. He is amazing. His, there's this poem of his called uh, The Story of not the story of us, something something about that, which is, uh, in fact, I'm so inspired by that since two nights, I've just been writing something in that uh, style, because it's very difficult for me to write in a very simple style. And I have to somewhere have my uh, inner rhyme scheme and, and flow like a river. But he writes very simply, but the stuff that he writes is so powerful. It's like dope. It's dope. Yeah. So, um, Anyway, so uh, can you, ending the, the interview, could I please request you to read one of your favorite poems? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I'm so honored that I have in the audience someone who is uh, Roma Vani. Roma Vani, hmm? she says she has interviewed Salman Rushdie. So, oh wow. my God. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, hmm. I should be. Um, uh, a little bit scared to read my poetry, therefore, but I am not. So this is, you know, love plus zero. Uh, you know, everyone knows about love minus zero. Love plus zero. Inside the raven was a beautiful woman. I could die for the rave. Take the love equals hurt equation, but not for the name. Raven and the beautiful woman. There is no way I could care for her. That is no cool rap to take on your shoulder someone else's weight. Just a plain disgrace. Beautiful. That's beautiful. But that's very short. You can read a slightly longer one. We want the audience to know. We want India and everyone to know. You know about your poems. I mean, everybody knows you, but I want you to read it out loud. Please. Okay. When, this is another uh, poem I really like. When the birds were ten. When the birds were ten and on the branch, the branch dripped thorns and made a den. When the birds were nine and on the bush, each wound bled into scarlet purse. When the birds were eight and nothing ate, 
vinegar and chamomile they did drink. When the birds became seven, they began to learn breathlessness and ribcage pain. Mm -hmm. Cannot keep one from breathing again and again. For love of life is not easily quenched. It comes in with each hungry gulp of sweet air. When the birds were six, you could count his ribs. When the birds were five, there was nothing dry. Hail, thunder, lightning, storm, and the drunk wet rye. When the birds were four, it was water and wine and something more. The naked was nude, its glory renewed. The graves were opening and the dead rude. When the birds were three, they were the nails, word, star, aloe, cinnamon, myrrh, frankincense, the sand pigeons of childhood, the dreams of Magdalene, Sarah, Mary, and Anna. Come, give me help now. The birds were two, it was she and you, and beyond words, the fire of love, the love of love burning him up till he was ready to drop. When the birds were one, they lit up the sun from its center and all at one. When the birds were none, his task was done. He heaved his last breath, breathed in black current. Sweet was the smell of rose briar and fawn. Beyond the door and blinding bright, the final dawn. That is beautiful. I mean, I want to applaud. That, that is beautiful, yeah. really. I, I haven't read that. You haven't, uh, I mean, I haven't read that in TSL. Oh, uh, yeah, no, that's uh, from this book. The one before the one we did. Okay, okay, that's beautiful. So I thank you again, once again, uh, Doctor, that you came and you honored us, and you were my first guest in Twinkling Conversation with Jukni. And uh, in fact, I became Jukni in your show. I mean, I stumbled upon the idea in your show. So I'm extremely grateful to the significant me for whatever uh, uh, you know, little poetry I do in the last few years, whatever little bit of um, I, I see I'm speechless. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And uh, I would like to tell the viewers once again, please subscribe to our channel and like our Facebook page. Give us hearts, give us likes so that we can come back to you with uh, more, with many more artists uh, who, you know, will tell you, you can talk to them up close and personal about, learn about their journeys and about their struggles and uh, about the intricate workings of their fascinating minds. Um, so thank you once again. This is Jukni signing off from Twinkling Conversations with Jukni.